Okay, um, this last session we're going to do before the exam is going to be on uh, just a review of statistics and uh, the last session we talked about in industrial hygiene sampling um, <coughs> is in the field of industrial hygiene we generate lots of data and sometimes we do repetitive, repetitive sampling and um, each time you go out and do a sampling event, even though it's of the same activity, same process, you will inevitably come up with a different number. And so sometimes you want to look at those numbers and be able to deal statistically with those numbers to try to figure out um, <clears throat> where your true number uh, actually falls into. So that's the necessity for doing a, a, just a basic review of, of some basic statistics and how they apply in the industrial hygiene field. And I have some examples here where I'll show you where you might encounter uh, the actual, actual application <coughs> of statistical methods in our in our day-to-day -day activities. So we're going to start off with talking about the basic uh, statistical <coughs> um, evaluation you might do with a group or set of numbers and that would be simply of figuring out what is the arithmetic mean of that number and the standard deviation of that number. So to start off with, this is the formula that we would use to take a group of numbers and come up with an arithmetic mean. And as you can see here from the formula, uh, basically the arithmetic mean is going to equal a summation of the, the number set that you have uh, divided by the number of observations you have in that set. So if I have three observations, I would have <clears throat> those three numbers added together divided by three to come up with what the arithmetic mean would be. Now, <clears throat> oftentimes um, what we will encounter is um, when you're looking at the mean of a group of set of numbers, especially in the uh, environmental safety and health area, you might find out that um, <clears throat> those numbers are, are quite a bit different. Uh, they can be orders of magnitude and difference. And so <clears throat> when we look at uh, those large spread of numbers, the, uh, to get the true picture of, of what the true data set might be, uh, the arithmetic mean doesn't work. Sometimes we have to look at the geometric mean, and we do that by, by applying the logarithmic function of, of the group of set of numbers. And uh, these are the formulas that we might use then in evaluating those numbers. And so the geometric mean is going to equal to the, the, the base 10 of the summation of the logs of each observation divided by the number of observations you would have. So simply put, instead of taking the, um, <coughs> the actual number that we did in the, the previous set, uh, figuring out the arithmetic mean, what we would do is we'd take the actual number um, in our widely dispersed numbers and take the logarithm of that, sum, summarize or uh, come up with a summation of the, the log of each of those numbers uh, divided by the number of observations that we have um, and that <clears throat> plugging it into this formula then we would come up with what the geometric mean of that group of set of numbers uh, would be. Now <clears throat> you can take the set, same set of numbers and uh, apply arithmetic mean and the geometric mean and, and when you do that you'll find out that um, uh, the end result, that mean number that you come up with, is, is going to be different for each set of calculations. Which one is the better or truer? Again, when you use the geometric mean is when you have numbers which have orders of magnitudes of difference in, in, the, in the data set. So <clears throat> one of the things that um, the other statistical evaluation that we would do um, uh, in comparison the numbers is, is we want to determine what is the standard deviation. The standard deviation is just telling us is of um, trying to give us an estimate of how close are we are to the true number. And we can go one standard deviation and be within a, a certain percentage of what the true number would fall into. You could go to two standard deviations and the likelihood of your real number falling in or the true number falling into that 
um, uh, two standard deviations is, is going to be even greater than a single standard deviation. So how do you come up and derive a standard deviation? We'll simply put, um, uh, we use this formula, and which is the, uh, the square root of the sum of the arithmetic mean minus the observation, the value that you're measuring it squared, divided by the number of observations minus one. And so that would give you the standard deviation for that particular uh, value set. And you continue to do that for all your value sets and you would have those standard deviations. Uh, again, um, this was an estimate, uh, a tool that we use to try to give us a better uh, understanding or appreciation of where that true value uh, truly lays. Now, uh, <clears throat> let's go back. Uh, we don't have a projector or chalkboard to write on, right? Uh, okay. Um, well, you'll have in your um, um, project assignments on statistics, you'll have the opportunity to, to uh, do this you should it's pretty straightforward just take your uh, um, your numbers of the particular question that you'll have in the project and plug them into these formulas and uh, get an example now just like in, in the arithmetic mean we can der we derive a standard G deviation in the when we're looking at the geometric mean of a number we can also come up with a geometric standard deviation and this first part of this formula here is an example of what we would use <coughs> to when we want to apply um, the geometric standard deviation. Again, what you're doing is applying the logarithmic evaluation of that. Now, um, in the particular projects that we will work on, we'll only use be using this uh, formula for standard deviation in in a, a particular calculation that in the environmental field you may often ha encounter. And, um, and that's uh, shown in this example uh, below here, the standard deviation, trying to figure out the percentage, percentage of a particular particle size. And um, <clears throat> you can see here, um, uh, what we're trying to do is we, we take a group of particle sizes and trying to figure out um, uh, where a particular size particle range would fall into. In this particular case on the first example, um, uh, if we wanted to figure out uh, a comparison of, of uh, 50 percentile, 50 percent um, of the particle sizes would fall in at uh, 84.3 percent particle size. Uh, we would just plug those numbers into this equation here on, your, on our left and we could figure out uh, that one. The, on the other end of the spectrum, if we wanted to look at the lower end of the particle sizes, uh, we could plug it into um, uh, the number here. And so you'll have an opportunity to, um, to work on some problems where it'll, uh, it'll give you a particular size range and I want you to uh, calculate out uh, where, 80, where the 84th percentile would lie and where the 50th percentile would lie and so on. And uh, again, it's simply just plugging in the numbers from, uh, from those uh, equations. <coughs> well, um, as we say, when we talk scientifically about numbers, when we generate a number, we, un we understand that um, there's a lot of error associated with deriving of those numbers. And, and so we need to be able to figure out <clears throat> um, a level of confidence that we know the true value falls into. And um, <clears throat> so what we'll often do is we'll use the equations you see here of trying to determine the upper and lower confidence limit that um, a particular value would fall into. Um, so um, how we would use this is, um, this is the formula on the left here of the lower confidence limit is going to be, be equal to the actual measured concentration that you have divided by its PEL 
uh, or it could be the TLV if that's what you choose to use, um, and then subtract the sampling and analytical error associated with that method that uh, is, has been pre-established in, in uh, a research study. And so every analytical method has some uh, associated uh, sampling error uh, with the method. It could be in the uh, sampling uh, equipment, the error could be in the analytical method that is being used, but that's a standard fixed value that is established um, uh, by various groups who publish these sampling and, and analysis methods. So <clears throat> in calculating out the lower confidence limit of a particular value and the upper confidence limit, we use simply uh, these, these two basic formulas here. So since I don't have a, a chalkboard, let me just illustrate to you um, uh, how this might work. Say we have a data set and uh, we did a sample and that sample came at this value and we'll just call it X and we want to know is that truly the value or how confident can we be that that's truly the value and and so what you would do is you would take that and um, apply the sampling analytical error and um, and you would get a range and that range could either be uh, from here to here as our uh, upper confidence limit and our lower confidence limit or <clears throat> it could be up here might be our upper confidence limit how do I get this typewriter thing to move um, and the lower confidence limit could be down here or um, when I do the calculation my upper confidence limit could be here and my lower one here So, if we looked at our data point here um, and did a comparison, we'd say if we looked at the upper and lower confidence limit in, in uh, this calculation, we would say the data point is definitely above the upper confidence limit, so we know uh, in this case we would have exceeded the permissible exposure limit. Um, now, if we looked at, did our calculation and that data point came in this range, uh, we would basically say, uh, well, we're not sure. We know that that data point lies in there, that range, um, but it, um, we don't know if we truly have exceeded it or not. And then finally, we could have a situation where it would be here, where the data point is truly below the lower confidence limit. And uh, at this point, we would, we would say, no, it's definitely not above the permissible exposure limit for this particular uh, sample set. So this is what OSHA would do. In this scenario over here, scenario one, they would say, um, you are in violation of the standard because this data point exceeds the upper confidence limit here uh, in this particular calculation. Whereas if they did that upper and lower confidence limit and they came up with the data point in this range, number two, uh, OSHA would basically say we don't have enough information to clearly give us enough confidence that they are, that the true value is above the permissible exposure limit. So um, they're not going to cite the employer. Most likely what they're going to do is go out and do additional sampling and see if they can, can better define where that data point truly falls. And then finally, in this scenario here, number three, where the data point is clearly below the lower confidence limit, as we see here, OSHA is basically going to say we're 99.9% uh, confident that it's below, well, in this case, it's 99.5% confidence that <clears throat> Uh, we're below the lower confidence limit, so there's no violation, or, no, or, <clears throat> or the employer is not exceeding 
the uh, permissible exposure limit for this compound. So this is, uh, whenever you're doing, we go out, the industrial hygienist goes out and does air sampling, we recognize that there's some margin of error. And uh, so we take those data points that we generate and we apply the sampling analytical error using these formulas for the upper and lower confidence limit. Um, and we can calculate out uh, to give us some certainty whether we do have an overexposure occurring or, or whether we're clearly uh, in a safe level for uh, that particular exposure and that uh, t particular event. So <coughs> that is basically where we would uh, typically use the application of upper and lower confidence limits in trying to um, uh, determine where exposures may or may not uh, occur. So um, what do we do then, Howard? Can we apply the same uh, uh, process to figuring out uh, confidence limits uh, for multiple uh, data sets? Um, say we go out and we get a data set um, and come up with a co calculated concentration of uh, a compound in air uh, over a sp specific time period um, and we did that multiple times throughout the day and we want to figure out what is if our uh, upper and lower confidence limits are, are being exceeded then this is the formula that we would use it's just an expansion of the other formula that we had however if you'll notice here and look at this um, uh, we can see that uh, this is going to be our typical formula that we use for uh, determining time-weighted average concentration. So all we're doing is uh, 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 basically um, um, applying uh, that formula into this confidence limit formula and uh, determining out the um, confidence limit for consecutive samples that are, that are being done. So just another application. <clears throat> well, the other thing that we often want to look at is when we go out and we, um, we look at multiple data sets, um, we're going to come up with different numbers. And we want to know, um, is uh, a particular number that's in this data set, is it an outlier or not? Or is it, do, does it truly fall within the realm of, <clears throat> of being a, um, a realistic or a true value? Um, uh, in our, in our uh, sampling analysis. And so um, what we do is one method of rejecting uh, a suspect value of being an outlier is we use this simple Q test. And uh, the Q test to try to uh, determine 90, with 90% 90 percent, 90 percent confidence is a value uh, that is in our data set um, a legitimate value or is it an outlier, then we can just simply use this basic formula here of taking your, um, your suspect value minus your nearest value to that and, um, and dividing that by the largest value from the smallest value. And um, depending on the number of values, uh, you can figure out statistically where that, uh, that Q uh, value would lie. <laughs> and uh, depends on where the, where that value comes out will depend where you reject that particular uh, value uh, or not. So this is the Q test application of that data set to try to figure out um, uh, an outlier uh, in your sampling data. Now another uh, comparative statistical application that we uh, that you might find being used is what was referred to as the t-test. <clears throat> and this is the student's t-test. You may or may not have used it in some of your other classes. Um, but basically, um, you use this uh, formula. Uh, the t-test is going to equal to the average, uh, the mean of the first uh, set of observations minus the uh, mean of the second set of observations divided by um, the uh, pooled standard deviation of that data set number uh, times the square root of 1 over, um, again, the number of observations in both data sets. Where to determine your um, 
a pool standard deviation, you use this formula down below uh, to, to calculate out uh, this value here. So what you do is you first go in and, and uh, again, looking at your number of observations times the standard deviation of that of those uh, uh, groups of observations or divided by the uh, number of observations uh, minus two, you come up with your pool standard deviation and then you just simply plug that uh, value again into this. And that's going to give you um, the student statistical analysis of, um, of that particular data set. Um, and then um, after you've done a, a der derived that t-test, you'll be able to um, um, determine uh, if that value um, that you have is, um, is going to be valid or a uh, usable value or not. So again, these are just a couple of the methods that we do is to uh, um, to look at uh, ranges that data have um, when we have multiple data sets. Uh, again, using the arithmetic mean um, uh, for numbers that are very uh, close and comparable. And, and from that arithmetic mean, we can derive the standard deviation, which just tells us Again, it gives us a clue uh, with some level of confidence where that true data point lies. When we're dealing with large um, uh, spreads of, of numbers, where we're dealing with orders of magnitude of difference, um, we simply apply the geometric um, mean uh, in, our, in our formula, <clears throat> and we can calculate out again what that geometric mean is and the geometric standard deviation. And then, um, and trying to get some level of confidence of where our true data point is going to fall into or lie. Uh, we use our calculations for our confidence limits and then to find out if a particular number that's being uh, used in our data set is an outlier or not, we can use um, uh, the Q-test or the uh, T-test to, to try to figure out um, uh, with some level of degree of confidence of, of whether those um, <clears throat> values are, are true or not. So um, that's how you'll be applying them. As I said, there's, I put together some projects to just give you some practice calculations on each, using each one of these formulas. They should be all fairly straightforward. So <clears throat> that pretty much ends up our lecture material for the first half of the semester. Um, uh, next week, we'll, we'll, uh, we will not have class meetings, but you will uh, be required to, to uh, complete the examination uh, by the end of next week. The examination is, um, as I mentioned, is a multiple choice examination. It's going to cover all the material that we've discussed during this first session <coughs> of the uh, semester. <coughs> um, there will be a number of calculations. You will not be required to memorize any of the formulas. The, there will be a formula sheet so you can look and pick out which formula you need to use for a particular uh, problem solving. Um, and um, the exam is broken into three sessions, 1A, 1B, and, and 1C. And, um, there's a group of questions because of the length of the examination. We, we felt that student could sit down. I think we've given a two hour time frame for each session. So you should have plenty of time to complete the uh, individual session. Um, you have all week to take all three sessions. You don't have to do it all in one time. Uh, if you want to uh, one day take a, the first session, then the next day you can come back and do uh, 1B and then uh, finally come back in another day or another time period and do 1C. Uh, the only th requirement is that by the end of the week you have all three of those um, sessions completed. Uh, again, most of the uh, material on the examination are, is going to be derived from the material in the lecture and uh, from the projects that you have. I will try to have all your projects 
that you submit graded by the end of this week or if you don't have them in um, by the end of this week, I'll, any projects that are turned in by Monday or Tuesday, I'll get them graded right away. So you know how you did on your projects and um, that will help you prepare uh, for the examination. So um, again, there's no class meeting next week, um, only the exam, all exams are done online. And uh, our next in-class meeting will be of Tuesday on the following week. So uh, with that, I um, encourage you to complete your projects as soon as possible. I'll get them graded as soon as possible, and good luck for the on the examination.